Palingenesis by Simon Hereward. Book One Progeny of Hate. Chapter 17 Revolt. The words were crude and heavy, like the stones in a dry river bed. The language of the Tork had ever struck him as the music of their dark and jealous hate. It blocked out the blue of the sky and the warmth of sun-tide, like the deep shadows of a tree-filled gorge, but with none of the peace and tranquility, only the uncertain menace. Now it spoke in authority, though Lund had heard it dimly, as if from some distance away, and not a mere yard or two. He heard the words clearly, nonetheless, though he had little regard for its meaning. Take him alive! There were other voices, angry, protesting, dissenting. Take his head! Rip him apart! Rank my slain! You dare! The first voice spoke again. We have need of this one. He will be kept for a special purpose. I will hear no more. Dark faces were close to his own, the eyes large and flaring red. He was unable to move, unable to scream. There were teeth, teeth on all sides except behind, where he was aware of the steady pressure of the stone wall. For a moment he could see his body from a distance, manacled to the wall, arms stretched out. He saw one mass of torque, and others standing close. Somehow, they reminded him of the hunting dogs, hungry for his blood, eager to witness his suffering. He felt the searing pain in his stricken left arm, and then he screamed, though no sound came, for his voice was as heavy and numb as his limbs. He awoke, gasping for breath. It was dark and quiet, apart from the familiar rhythmic drip of water. His body was damp with perspiration, and he was ragingly thirsty. He moved his head slightly to glance around him. It was his cell. He was alive and awake in his cell. For a few moments he lay still, searching for reasons how this could be possible. His memories were dim and confused, filled with pain and dark threats. He could not be certain if he had been in another chamber, a punishment cell, or if he had been brought straight to his own. Why was he spared? Did they plan some gruesome end for him to cow the others? What would they have in store for a killer of their kind? Close to his head was a large water pitcher. There were also three small black loaves and a bowl of cold broth. His stomach moved with hunger, as he picked up the well-known smells. He sat up, ignoring the aches and bruises. His left arm hung limp and heavy at his side. The water was cool and musty, tasting of the oxyard well, and he finished half the pitcher before leaning back against the wall with a sigh. He tore clumsily at the bread with his right hand, the fingers stiff round the tight, broken skin of the palm. All too soon he had cleaned out the bowl, and swallowed the last crumb of bread. He slipped down onto the straw, closing his eyes. Kor drew gnarled fingers across his brow. The dream had departed, but had left him trembling in its wake. He clutched his hands together and stared, searching at the all-too-familiar stonework, as if there were some comfort to be found in the walls of his prison. He was old, older than he could remember, and his remaining strength was failing fast, not in the steady slide of old age, but the sharp and final decline preceding death. And now it had come at last, the peril long foreseen, whose undefined shape ever lurked on the borders of one's senses, had broken upon them like a sun-tide storm. The countless cycles of plotting, the small victories and defeats, 
the masters who had come and gone. It all counted for nothing now. His dream of escape, the shaping of his prodigies, the pain he had felt whenever they had been lost to him, the fierce hope that was the young runner Lund. Somewhere during the night all these intense moments of his life had been swallowed by the dark. He was afraid to close his eyes now, afraid like a small child. He wanted to doubt what he had seen and heard, for the first time in his life, for surely it was better not to know, to be overtaken unawares by one's grim fate, than to await it with trepidation. Many masters he had known, and always he had struggled against them, with whatever means had been available to him. But he had understood their motives, the produce of the slave farms, the entertainment of the fighting pits, and the hunting trails, even the pleasure of inflicting pain on those who could not resist. This was the world of the cruel overlord, the world in which he was the victim. Yet this world had at once been rendered obsolete by the arrival of the latest in this procession of demons. The new master of Grail had not come to rule, but to exterminate. He was a destroyer of the most perverse kind, one who bent the natural laws of life in order to twist himself into dark power, and he had been sent only for the purpose of destruction. The Old One, the great king of the Tork, had tired of the amusement with which his torment of Vran slaves had supplied him for so long. He would rid himself of them all. Yet how could it be that he would no longer need the mass of food and wrought metal flowing northwards from Grail? Where were the peoples who had consumed these goods? It was difficult for Kor to believe that he had not imagined the revelation that had come to him this night. But the destroyer had arrived. There was no doubting his intentions. What other explanation could there be? He allowed his hands to slide away from his face and fall limply to his sides. How much time was left to them? He did not know, and this ignorance multiplied his fear. There would be one last effort made, one final bid for freedom, despite their pitiful lack of resources and trained men. He could delay no longer. It was futile, of course, but had it ever been anything more? In a way, he was relieved that his long struggle would finally cease. Zabrin lazily opened his eyes. The tiniest of smiles lined his mouth as he observed the obvious tension in Groth's face. How amusing it was to see the once self-assured, even slightly condescending manner of his subordinate slip away. And well, he may be nervous, this overseer. It was almost impossible to concentrate on what was being said, while the warm life pulsed so close, so irresistible. He could sense the faint undulations, the throbbing twist and turn through tiny passages, and then there was the thirst, a dull, mesmerizing power that made a mockery of reason. It was foolish to allow anyone into his presence so soon after his feeding. He knew this, but the disaster of the tenth day past had to be countered with haste. Or had it? He could muster little concern for the affairs of Grail, or the overindulged lords of Nunmeric, while the slow surge of power ebbed and flowed so tantalizingly. His world had shrunk to that forceful pulse inside, ever increasing in intensity till the frail body could hardly contain it, and his awareness had flowered beyond the senses of his frame. Somewhere to the north, was the potency of Horn in Runag, his powers reaching in all directions like the many legs of a spider, to east and west, a bulging threat in the wasted lands, and the innumerable savages of the jungle, blood-lusting dogs on the leash. His agents were everywhere, his forces unmatched, his enemies dismayed and unaware. What a time to be alive! 
he found it difficult not to laugh out loud. The voice of his chief overseer floated in and out of his understanding, but he grasped the essence of its message ere long. Rank of Munborg had been slain by a runner. His family demanded that the guilty slave be handed over to them. Yet Ulbrun of Nunmeric, a favored one of Horan, had claimed the slave's life for the blood guilt sacrifice, since he was the only one they possessed who had spilt to her blood. It was a simple matter. He held up a hand to stop the flow of words. He has been punished. Groth was taken aback. Who, my lord? The slave, of course. There was a slight hesitation. Yes, Lord Zabrin. But Aldrin interfered. Enough. Zabrin was tired of the conversation. Tell the grieving relatives that the slave has been punished, and that Horan Indranag himself will avenge the brave rank. He had known this warrior, and though more than able, he had found rank to be somewhat overconfident and foolish. There were far too many of his kind among the tour of their age. They would not deprive their lord of the pleasure, now would they? He nodded curtly in the direction of the doorway. Now go. I have other matters to attend to. The night was filled now with confusing, fearful phantasms. Sometime during the hunt, between the elation of slaying a hunter and the horrible pain of the recapture, Lund had crossed the boundary of the mind. Even while asleep, he could not cease his struggle to survive, let alone find the deep peace of a healing rest. Kor was strangely distant, both in thought and direct aid. The supplies, usually brought by Lurin, were sorely missed, more for the active support they signified than the contribution they would make to a speedy recovery. The struggle against dejection and fear became a losing battle, and it was painfully clear to him that he could not be sustained by hatred alone. The blows he had struck against the hunter had not been merely for himself, but for every downtrodden slave, every runner cruelly murdered, every fighter forced to strike down his brother. Each passing day brought the expectation that he would be moved from the trails to the arena. Had he not achieved that of which most fighters could only dream? Surely such a deed would earn him a place among them. Yet his expectancy carried with it a large amount of apprehension. In the arena, mere cunning, skill, or good fortune would no longer be enough to survive the tenth day. He would be forced to fight for his life every time. Moreover, the killing of an opponent would not bring any comfort or satisfaction, for the cost of his continuing success and survival would be measured in lives of Ron slaves like himself. Kor returned from wherever he had been shortly before the next hunt. A tow-headed boy, even smaller than Lurin, brought a knife and the usual supplies. Lund smiled at the awed stare of the youngster, remembering the days when he had run such errands for long-surviving runners. What hope that kindled in his heart. One of them would survive, one of them would escape, to bring salvation and rescue to his people. How strange to think that he had become the symbol of such hope to the likes of this child. The admiration in the trainee's eyes faded somewhat at the sight of Lund still bruised the lacerated left arm the long, raking cut across his torso, and the stiff, swollen right hand. This last seemed to fascinate the boy, who fastened his wide eyes upon it, when Lund reached to take the curved blade from his outstretched hand. He grasped the injured hand between his own, turning the palm upwards. Like the shy touch of the first morning ray of light, his whisper filled the cell. You killed him with a talon. Lund looked down into the large eyes. Where there should have been fear and timidity burned only a passionate courage. Breaking the rule of silence was punished most severely, and more often than not resulted in the loss of one's tongue. This small act of defiance oddly emboldened him also, 
and he felt the dark despondency lifting. Instead of merely nodding, he whispered back his reply. Yes, through the eye. The boy looked down at the hand again, a frown settling on his brow. He touched the palm with a careful finger. Did he hurt you? Yes. Their eyes locked in mutual understanding. There was no need for explanations. What is your name? The boy withdrew his hands and appeared more than a little startled with his own audacity. The awe of seeing the slayer of a hunter in person had to have worn off. A furtive look crept back into his eyes. His whisper was barely audible. Brennick. He glanced behind him at the dark opening in the floor and turned to go. Lund searched for something to say to the boy, but his contemplations had been of such a somber nature recently that he felt little more than sadness and pity. As the youngster crouched over the grate, he noticed the wheel from the chafing of the manacle round his ankle and the markings of the whip on his bare arms and legs. But more potent than the marks of brutality on his body were the shadows of his destiny to run in the hunting trails, to flee in fear without the hope of escape, till his body had been shattered and his head would be a trophy for the wicked. Thank you, Brennick. His voice had been so loud that the boy stared at him in shock. Then he nodded quickly and disappeared into the hole. Kor's thought barely broke through the bitterness. I hope you will find the little I could spare you sufficient. Of course. I appreciate the least aid I receive. You know that. Many things have occupied me of late. I thought... Are you angry with me? Angry? You have stirred up hope throughout Greenland. This may give us the courage we need. Lund could still see the respectful eyes of Brennick and the boldness engendered there. You sent a new boy. Is learned well. There was a slight hesitation. He was caught, clambering back in through the grating. Lund felt the sudden shock and a pang of guilt. He had been the cause of the boy's late return. He is dead? No. He was punished. And he is chained up at night. Chains had hardly been used for ten cycles or more since the cells had proven sufficient to keep the slaves inside. Each slave was still manacled round the ankle, but this was mainly used for roping them together in a field team, or securing them to the wall of a punishment cell. He is lost to you? Sir, he will return. They believe he was hunting for rats. They already tired of checking his cell at night. The chain is a small matter. This brought Lund some relief but it also meant that he would have to deal with his injuries on his own. Barely two days remained before he would be back in the forest. The next thought that came to him was as welcome as it was unexpected. He could feel his pulse quicken as it flowered into meaning. There will be an uprising during the next ten days. An uprising? You will not take part in it. This is important. Most of the runners won't. You will try to escape to breach the line. It is the best opportunity you will ever have, and perhaps the last. The last? The new master of Grail is not like his predecessors. He is a demon, such as I have not encountered before. He has come to destroy every last Vran slave in every clearing. The masters no longer have need of us. Lund could not think of a reply. He sat in silence, trying to comprehend these tidings with little success. No need. What could this mean? The Torque would not have lost their lust for blood and sport. Had they found prey that would provide them with greater satisfaction? He turned his mind to another burning question. Why did they not move me to the arena? You have spilled Torque blood. They keep you for a sacrifice. A sacrifice? His fate was sealed then. There could be no escape from it. When? I do not know. It matters little. What matters is that you stay alive the tenth day. Stay alive. So they would not move him to the fighting pits. Lund did not know whether he was relieved or disappointed. Though the thought of the intended sacrifice had dispelled any hopes of survival as a runner. However, now that there was to be an uprising, it mattered little where and how the Torque intended for him to end his life. He shuddered with excitement. 
not during all his time in Grail, six long cycles of hardship and fear, had he witnessed a coordinated act of resistance from the slaves. There had been several incidents, swiftly dealt with by the Torque, and individuals torn to pieces and tossed to the beasts soon after. Now, at last, the blood of the oppressors would flow. It would be their turn to fall before the fighters who formerly bled for their sport. Now they would become the target for the terrible strength and skill they had allowed to take shape. The Vran warriors they publicly scoffed at but privately feared. It would be a pity to miss such a spectacle. Yet he knew that all too soon help would arrive for the masters. The wagon road would bring armies of keepers and hunters. Unless a slave escaped, to find aid in the unknown vastness beyond the woods, their freedom would not last long. He would run and find this aid. There would be no dogs, no beaters with nets to pursue him, and time enough to work his way through the line. He would return with warriors, with weapons and armor, with knowledge and strength. A searing pain in his left arm made him flinch as he turned over. The forearm was stiff and swollen, an angry red. Certainly this discomfort would sap his strength and slow his running on the tenth day. He sighed and searched in his mind for the familiar rhythms that had eluded him these many nights. He had to find healing sleep. And with the awakening of hope, he had first sensed in the boy Brennick's stare, flowered into fierce anticipation with the news from Kor, it was within his reach at last. He felt the eyes of the other forerunners on him, and though he knew that he was in poor condition, he could sense the awe and respect flowing from them. He had done the impossible, and must therefore be more than just a man, more than a mere Vran slave. The same four youths, who had eluded the hunters in the fog on the previous tenth day, now stood quivering with excitement and fear next to him. It was but their second run, and though he had no more cycles than they, Lund felt so much older by comparison. Not only was he running for the seventh time, but there were dead enemies strewn in his wake. Already he had become a prize quarry. All the hunters today would be eager for his blood, eager to avenge the insult to their pride. Coins would have changed hands, special instructions given, though such efforts to inspire the beaters would hardly be necessary. Their own fear would stir up their diligence. Not a single runner would escape. They knew it. In their eyes, barely hidden by their fearful energy, lay the utter despair of the doomed. No fog would conceal them today. No miracle occur to keep them out of reach unless this worn, injured champion before them had power to provide such. Lund glanced at each in turn, as if to measure their anguish. Only one held his gaze, a sallow-complexioned youth slightly taller than the others. Instinctively he felt for the boy's mind, surprisingly sensing the echo almost immediately. At last he had found one. He spoke without looking at the youth. Your lady? Breath I Breath. Once they release us, circle back to the first clearing. I will not wait long. He could feel the respect and gratitude in the other's reply. I will come. The five runners were sent off in different directions. This was not done for their benefit, but simply to prevent any single hunter from bagging too many trophies. When the sighting horn sounded in different locations, the hunter had to choose which one he would heed. Even as he started out, Lund felt the heaviness in his stride. He had not fully recovered, and could not risk an attempt to outdistance the beaters. He was more than grateful for Kor's presence, without which his frayed nerves would unravel completely. I need to hide. Yes. I will watch for you. I do not have the strength for another fight. I am glad you realize it. It was a day of dread, dismal and unfriendly. No harmony could he find between his movements and the underbrush. No agreement could be reached between his feet and the uneven forest floor. His running was nowhere near a dance. It was a grueling struggle. Too soon his heart was heavy and defeated. 
He turned for the clearing with the utmost difficulty. Earth was waiting when he arrived, his face a mask of concentration. At least one of the runners had regained the hope for survival. Wordlessly, he fell in behind Lund. Stay close if you want to look out the day. Even in his weakened condition, it was soon clear to Lund that the other would not keep up for long. Oddly enough, this seemed to bolster his morale. Perchance the responsibility for another's safety could dispel the gloomier aspects of his thinking for a while. In this way, Brith's mere presence more than made up for his lack of skill, and the slower pace they had to set as a result. Kor, however, was not long in airing his disapproval. You should not have picked up the straggler. I cannot let them die. You will have to if you want to live. If I cannot save them, I do not want to live. There was no reply to this last comment, but Lund sensed something resembling a mental sigh. Kor was frustrated with him yet again, and well he might be, since this crazy sentiment spelled more danger to his subject. Lund had to sacrifice the few in order to aid the many. His futile attempts at protecting a doomed runner could destroy all possibility of escape. He knew this all too well, and had fought these instincts from the start. Just when they had welled up again with such force, he could not tell. The headless corpses of runners in the forest, Lurin's selfless assistance, the begging eyes of this day's quarry. He had not the strength of will to ignore all these moments. He would run for them, run to find them deliverance, but he could not turn away from helping them if it was within his power. Behind him the breathing of his companion was growing heavier. He was clearly not used to running uninterrupted for such a length of time, since the runner often had to slow down or stop to investigate and avoid possible traps. Lund merely held out a warning arm, pointing out the places of which to steer clear in passing. Brith was quick to react to these warnings, grateful that he was not the leader in what seemed no less than a suicidal dash. At least if Lund's judgment failed, he would not be the one impaled or disabled. Yet he marveled at the certainty with which these judgments were made. How is it you see the trap so easily? Kor. Ah. Oh. Yes. No one stays alive here long without aid. This remark was not lost on the straining youth behind him. Only a few more yards brought them to the place Lund had been seeking. The southwestern wedge in which they were running this day afforded few good hiding places. Only rarely the muddy ground was covered thickly enough to hide the body of a man, let alone two men. It was also near impossible to erase one's tracks in the wet soil. Lund stepped gingerly over a near stagnant stream, taking care to place his feet on the stones protruding here and there from the mud. When he was almost clear of the soggy patch, he crouched down and scooped up handfuls of the wet earth. Motioning to Brith to follow suit, he smeared the dark soil over his arms, legs, and torso, splashed a generous amount on his back, and drew an open-fingered hand across his face. Both ears were dirtied as well as his hair. Thoroughly besmirched, they leaped onto a stony outcrop, and made their way through a carpet of dried leaves to the reverse slope of the gully containing the stream. Though the trickle hardly made a noise, it would not do to have their hearing impaired, and thus sacrifice a possible warning of approaching danger. Evergreen shrubs and undergrowth afforded the best shelter, casting deep shadows, while covering them with a shield of fleshy leaves. The runners installed themselves with care, establishing a route for a quick exit if discovered, and settled down for a long wait. A feeling of relative safety stole over them. Kor warned of approaching beaters some distance away, but this was to be expected. The high sun-tide heat found them, even crouched in the shade as they were, till the air became heavy and moist, and tiny streaks of sweat made patterns of their own through the mud blustered on their frames. Not even an hour passed before they heard the first sounds of the beaters. They moved in groups of three, occasionally calling out to one another, shoving spears into thickets they could not probe visually with ease. The call sounded from the gully containing the streamlet, 
and was echoed soon after by another away to their left. A man came into view, walking almost the exact path they had taken to their hiding place. Lund gritted his teeth as both runners silently gripped their curved blades. Had he not sensed the evil of this day before he had even started out? Two more beaters appeared behind the first. There was a remarkable difference in their mood to when he had encountered them previously. Gone was the careless banter, the semi-indolent slouching. All three held their spears at the ready, scanning the undergrowth for any sign of life. The sighting horn rode warily in the hand of the hindmost figure, ready to sound the warning. Lund felt the pulse of his quickened heartbeat in his temples. Breath's fear-tinged thought broke through his own. Do we run? Stay hidden. Let them pass. Then we run. Closer came the dark men, half crouching to peer into the shadows. It was oddly gratifying to sense their fear, the slight shaking of the spear blades pointed at them. Lund felt a sudden stirring in his blood, almost irresistible, to let slip the frail leash of control he had over his anger. Every nerve was stretched to the utmost. He almost willed the beater to stare straight at them to discover their position. Only the frightened breathing of the youth next to him kept him back. The boy would certainly perish in the aftermath of an attack on the beaters, for he did not have the skill to escape from the inevitable pursuit. Neither did he, he thought bitterly, but that seemed to matter little now. All the forest had shrunk to this hateful life pulsing so close to his. They were so near he could smell them, for a few tantalizing moments before they swept past, nervously mouthing the all-clear call to the next group. Brith lay back with an inaudible sigh. Puzzling at the figure still tensed and ready next to him, he touched Lund lightly on the arm. The intense struggle for control was still visible on the other's face as he turned in response. Shockingly, it became clear to him that the struggle was not against fear as his had been, but against aggression. You want to jump them? There was no response. Either the runner was too occupied with his own thoughts, or he would not admit to such madness. Instead, he held out a dirty hand towards his reclining companion to pull him to his feet. Let us be off, he whispered under his breath. They had not traveled half a mile before the sighting horn sounded ominously some distance ahead of them. Kor's warning came moments later. Find a place to hide. They are heading in your direction. The undergrowth was thorny and sparse forcing them to waste precious moments searching around for a suitable place to hide. The horn sounded again, this time answered in short succession and from different directions, by two hunting horns. They had hardly crawled into a thicket when the excited voices of the beaters reached their ears. Shortly the crash and thudding of many bodies sounded through the forest. Four or five beaters came into view breathing heavily. They lingered, gripping their weapons in fevered fingers. A hunter appeared. He carried a large crossbow, the broad-haired bolt latched and ready. They waited in silence, then moved away through the trees. Lund had already decided that they had had another miraculous escape when he heard the unmistakable release of the bolt, and almost simultaneously the cry of the stricken runner. A body crashed into the tiny clearing in front of them, tugging at the shaft protruding from its side. Could they reach him before the shooter? How oh, so? You will be seen. The wounded man slumped to the ground barely ten paces away. Already they could hear his pursuers breaking through the undergrowth close by. Incredibly, the runners started crawling towards their hideout. Lund gritted his teeth. The gods conspired to bring about my death. There was no hiding now. The dying runner was almost at their feet when the hunting party came upon them. Run, back the way we came, then veer left and keep going. Shouts surrounded them, clawing at them. Another group had arrived, eager for the kill, blocking their way. Lund forcibly shoved Brith away to his right, then smashed into the wall of beaters. He had no time to grip the talon, for what little good it could have done him. 
for he had not properly fought through the flailing arms when, unbelievably, the tip of a black bolt passed through the back of his left shoulder to sprout in painful finality from beneath his collarbone. He was thrown off balance, the left side of his body suddenly dull and heavy. The stock of a crossbow slammed into the side of his head, exploding the world into sick pain. Part of him would not accept his doom, and struggled vainly to keep him on his feet. He darted away, his blurring vision robbing him of a clear way of escape. Dieters blocked his way, swinging vicious spears at him. He swerved round them, fighting the blackness threatening to engulf him. There was a reason to try, to keep their efforts focused on capturing him. Brith had cleared the beater's line. Perhaps he could still buy time for him to escape. The butt end of a spear crashed into his body with a force that sent him sprawling. As he leaped to his feet again, the broken ends of rib bones touching brought a gasp from his lips. The impossible pain leached the will to resist from his body. He merely stood waiting, not sure from which direction his death would come. The beaters had ringed him in, their spears pointing at his bleeding frame. Above the anguish of his body, he felt the blood trickling from his right ear, down the line of his jaw to stain the ground between his feet in long, slow streaks of wetness. He brought his hand up to touch his chin, stared at the dark red liquid on his fingers. A hunter stepped into the ring, a heavy flanged mace in his right hand. He flung away his helmet carelessly, revealing the broad face and pale greenish skin of the torque. He snorted with disdain and addressed himself to the beaters. This is the one? This one slew rank? There were nods and murmurs all round. The torque spat at his feet, his red eyes flaring in hatred. His bearing invited the runner to attack. Lund could hardly look at him. Strength had faded from his grip. He did not even reach for the talon. The first blow brought him to his knees. He lowered his head, which had somehow grown too heavy to hold up any longer. Hurt! The barked command struck a faint chord in his memory. The massive frame of a torque hunter, stepping through the brush, was more familiar still. He sagged to the ground, convinced that he had somehow lived through this nightmare before. Take an ear, or the small finger of the shield band. There was angry dissent from the first hunter. The head belongs to me. Olbrin took a step closer. Take the ear, or nothing at all. He thrust the finger in the direction of the fallen slave. This one is for the darkening sacrifice. Why do you let him run then? Will you argue with me, Dunkor? There was a glaring silence. The first hunter flung his furious retort through his teeth. I will not bow to your wishes, Ulbrin. This trophy belongs to me, and I will have it. He drew a long dagger and stepped forward to sever the head of his prey. The massive torque moved with astonishing speed. The other had no opportunity to raise his weapon before the claw-like fingers closed round his throat. Through the blur of pain, Lund realized that this warrior would never have fallen to an ill-equipped and injured runner as the luckless rank had. Olpern was made of sterner stuff and seemed to project an irresistible potency with every movement and expression. Now he shook the hunter like a rag doll, held in the death grip of his one hand, till the latter dropped his dagger and grasped the other's wrist with both hands. Ulbrin waited till he gaped like a fish, eyes bulging, and then flung him away with contempt. Get him out of my sight! Several beaters moved to obey, stooping down to where the injured hunter lay on his back. The sound of wheezing breath through his injured windpipe was the only indication that there was still life in him. Two more hunters appeared, one with a grim trophy in his belt. They looked on unconcernedly as their compatriot was lifted onto a makeshift frame by the beaters. One of them shoved Lund with a booted foot. What about the runner? Aldrin shrugged, then addressed the remaining beaters. Let him. Take him back. Rough hands closed on Lund, careless of his injuries, till the wave of pain engulfed his senses and wakefulness in complete darkness. A head, a pile of heads, 
blood caked air like torn weeds rounding once familiar features. There was Birth's contorted face, the shock of being separated from its body still written on it. Every gaping mouth was screaming, calling for aid that could not be found, till his mind reeled with it, and he tried to bring up his hands to ward them off. Only his arms would not obey him. Heavy and lifeless, they lay at his sides. There was no way to still the voices and their painful screams coursing through him, beating in his veins, jerking his body into fits of coughing, till the blood came rushing to his mouth, and he retched and choked on it. There were hands now, hands that turned him over to prevent his drowning, slowly washing the thickening flow from his face, touching his brow with coolness, till the throbbing fire in his skull faded to dark silence. All reason and sanity had fled. The shards of daylight hours passed in a haze of moaning half-dreams. Wakeful moments brought no escape, for he could not find a way to slake his terrible thirst or ease the aching of his body. Nights were filled with screaming fits, though he was increasingly aware of companionship and aid. A hand would close over his mouth till he thought to suffocate, but the screaming would stop despite his struggles. Life-giving water would pour into him after, and he would sleep without a dream. Once he was clear enough to see a frowning face leaning over him, Brilliant. he was not sure whether he had spoken the name aloud. And there was another presence. The healer had returned to him. Surely he would be saved now. Lund woke to the comforting rhythm of dripping water, as on so many occasions when he had had no reason to hope for survival. Here at last, was the dull echo of the droplets plunging to their death on the slippery, polished stone below, the sound of safety. Despite the hated bars of his cage, the cell was the sole place of rugged comfort to which he had access. His body was a cage of inertia, comfortably devoid of pain. He strongly suspected that all this would change the moment he moved a muscle. Yet he had to do something about the thirst still parching his throat. There would be a jug of water within reach. He turned his head ever so slightly, inviting complaints seemingly from every joint. The walls and dark roof of the cell spun round in cartwheels of irregular motion till he closed his eyes to shut it out. Blindly, he searched the floor with his right hand. There were two water jugs. He gripped the lighter of the two and brought it slowly, carefully to his mouth. The cool refreshment left him sighing with contentment, though he was shaking with even this little effort. The water slaked his thirst, but also stirred the hunger cramps in his empty stomach. Strangely, there were no customary black loaves or bowl that he could see. Why would they starve him, now that he had been deemed valuable enough to spare? Would they not want a healthy specimen for their sacrifice? The dark memories of the hunt clouded his mind. He had gazed at the certainty of death, and it made him tremble still. What pride he could have taken in his abilities to evade or even to fight when cornered had suffered an irreparable blow. There was no reason apart from some lucky chance that he was still alive. He counted the fingers on each hand, then reached tentatively for his ears. No trophies had been taken. He had been fortunate in this also. He lay back and reached for Kor. At once he sensed the joy and relief in the other's mind. You are awake? Yes. How, how long has it been? Three days. There is no food here. What has happened? There is much to explain. I will send someone to you right away. Lund first thought he had misunderstood. In broad daylight. There was an odd sensation as of grim satisfaction. The keepers will not enter your cell any time soon. In fact, if you are able, you can walk out of it right now. Brennick appeared soon after. For all Lund's heightened expectations, he entered the usual way. There was a transformation in his manner, though. The boy was all energy and excitement, bustling about the cell as if his activity alone could rejuvenate the comatose form. 
He had brought food in ample supply, as well as a draft of the type Luren had given him before. Among the torrents of whispered information, Lund soon gathered that the uprising had commenced. There had been no active resistance thus far, but the keepers and overseers had been driven out of the cells by the rumor and threat of a plague. Only slaves still served the supposedly diseased, daily carrying out disfigured bodies smuggled from the feeding pits. The night attack on the barracks in the town of Grail would only take place in three days' time. Then also the runners would make their bid for freedom. Even as Lund understood the simplicity and daring of the plan, he realized that he would be unable to play any part in it. With barely enough strength to take a drink of water, he would not be in any shape to face the long stretch of forest in only three days. Bitterness boiled up in him. The greatest opportunity for escape. The moment that would never come again, and he would be excluded. Why had he survived and fought only to arrive at such a place? If there were gods participating in the affairs of men, they did it but for their cruel sport. There was little sense in it, this incredible run of ill luck. Zavran slowly shook his head as he considered the events of the ten days past. He would be considered a weakling soon, unfit to govern. Dissatisfaction and complaints by the hunters, the slump in action and excitement in the arena, farm production falling in every clearing. It was hard not to believe there was a conspiracy afoot. To make matters worse, Rank had had to get himself killed by a runner, the first hunter to die in the trails in more than a hundred cycles. And now the highly favored Lord Ulbrin had decided to stay on in Grail, for what reason if not to watch his every step? Is it surprising then that a frowning groth would bring him such dire news after the first tenth day of moderate success in the hunting trails? A plague had broken out among the slaves in the fighting pits. He had been told that they were hardy and strongly resistant to disease. Had the deprivations of the past ten day weakened them? Had he unwittingly contributed to this disaster? What course of action to follow was less clear than ever, but that he would have to act decisively and quickly to save what remained of his reputation had become vital. Should he have the fighting pits cleared, the afflicted killed, the bodies burnt? How would he restock the arena? He suddenly longed to fulfill his mission and be rid of the foul place. Yet no word had arrived as yet to allow him a swift and simple way out. No, the convenience of others would determine whether he had to deal with the petty though troublesome issues of Grail. The guards bluntly refused to enter the fighting pits. Despite threats and some examples made, they would rather risk the ire of their master than the almost certain death by contracting the plague. And a very potent strain it seemed to be, for reports from Groth, the only overseer brave or foolish enough to enter the infected quarters, were filled with horrific images of bloated, blackened corpses strewn among the living. The weak moaning of these last filled the passages where the dead bodies of rats had suddenly turned up by the score. Would this disease not spread to the town or the burrows of Grail? Should he not give the order to destroy all these filthy creatures? He shuddered in disgust. The slums and squalor of Munborg could not begin to compare with these pits. There would be immense satisfaction in eradicating the last remnants of this cursed ilk. A frightening thought passed through his mind. For a moment, a mere instant, he wondered what could have motivated the Great One to construct this place. 
The flicker of doubt, tiny and fleeting though it was, caused him great alarm. The smallest breach in his faith and devotion could result in a weakness in mind and motive he could not afford. All thoughts of a subversive nature had to be suppressed immediately. Surely Grail was built for more than entertainment and sport. It was built to fuel Horan's rage, his hatred of all things connected to the favored. It was not a source of foodstuffs or metals only, but a potent reminder of the many wrongs still to be righted. Here one's anger might grow irresistible, and anger drove the transformation. Zabron believed in the compelling wisdom of his lord. Without such certainty, the power he craved would elude him. Worse, his quest for it, if not completely successful, would leave him weakened and maimed, drifting halfway between the world of men and that of true power, an impotent monster subject to pity and scorn. He would not act outside his commission. He would wait patiently for the instructions from Lakeside. Horan in Ronag had reasons beyond the comprehension of his vassals, and would not tolerate misguided initiative on their part. The plague-ridden slaves would have to be dealt with as best he could, without resorting to extermination. Though the tidings of Lund's survival had gladdened his heart, Kor had already accepted the inevitable. His long-favored runner would not be at hand when the time was ripe for escape. Why this seemed to be such a heavy blow, he could not say. There were more than twelve hundred runners and trainees in Grail. Chances were that one of them would manage to clear the forest before reinforcements could arrive to put down the revolt. He would not send out so many, of course. More than half of them were too young still, and many of the older ones would be needed to aid the fighting men in their task. Yet all the hopes these youths would carry with them paled in comparison to the almost tangible assurance he had sensed so often in Lund. He had known it when the terrified little boy had first arrived in Grail. Since the day he had pierced the fog of confusion in the child's mind and driven from it the wild animal fear, he had become more and more aware of a brightness, an expectation of renewal wrapped around this small, fragile life. Kor had struggled long and hard enough with harsh reality not to harbor fantasies of a miraculous escape. He could hardly imagine what a world without Grail would be like. But somewhere during the many cycles of protecting and training this youth, he had become convinced that deliverance was more than fanciful thought. He had touched its genesis. Six days they waited, till they could hardly breathe the fetid air in the pits, and the acrid smell of burnt flesh hung like a pall over the town. The arena, the training grounds, the running trails, all lay deserted as if death had claimed every last inhabitant. An incessant baying and howling rose from the feeding pits, but no one would tend to the dogs and beasts caged there. Fierce scuffles broke out among them, the weaker ones torn to pieces first, while those with no access to the dismembered threw themselves with the iron bars still preventing them. The keepers of Grail had barricaded themselves in the town. Large piles of rhine and yendel leaves smoldered at intervals throughout the deserted streets, raining soot on every structure. There was no activity in the market at all, and the outer shutters of every home were firmly sealed. By sundown, a small clustered squad of keepers entered the large oval of the arena, their mouths and noses well covered with scarves dipped in extract of yendel, the unfortunate few scuffled over to the gateways leading to the fighting pits, assuring themselves that these were still firmly chained and locked. Ignoring the wailing of the feeding pits, they hastened off with repugnance and fear at their heels. An overseer followed with a gang of slaves, pulling behind them a half-dozen handcarts containing the daily rations for the fighting men. 
He only went as far as the gates, shunting through the workers with kicks and muffled but vicious swearing from behind his scarf. When the last of the pits had been serviced, he inspected the carts, nodding with approval. All but a few of the rations had been distributed. The death rate was clearly slowing. At least there would be a touch of good news for the master this night. Inside the tunnels, the Vran slaves savored their even meal. Augmented with all that could be spared from their smuggled supplies, it was a veritable feast. But then it would be the last meal for many of them, perhaps all. Illegal conversations blossomed everywhere. There were pleasantries, a crude twisting of their mouths that were the imitations of forgotten smiles. A light-hearted, heady mood clothed the hopeful and disheartened alike. Even if they failed completely, there would not be another tenth day of sport for them. If they succeeded, theirs would be the names revered and remembered by the free generations to come. Silently, like shadows of the night, they slipped their chains and passed the bars of their prison. Three large columns crept across the stained sand of the arena, aiming for the deep darkness of the eastern wall. The doorway of the armory yawned open. More shadows strayed into the night. Wordlessly, furtively, the sharpened steel passed from hand to hand, till at least three score of the band was armed with swords and axes that had spilt so much blood of their kind. The men of the first column had scaled the outer walls by now and cast their ropes in murky recesses to float unseen and unheard in the free earth below. Not courage or wariness could save the watchers of the gate from their curved blades. There was no outcry to warn the sleepy keepers of the town. Several hundred more shadows joined the columns from the direction of the running trails. Breathless with anticipation, they fell in with their fellows, passing what weapons they had to the trained fighters in the lead. Without orders or whispered instruction, the columns moved off. Here and there, Horan's pale light gleamed softly on bare skin, or leaped momentarily in their eyes. Silently, they surged forward, irresistibly, towards the quarters of the hated Keepers of Grail. And with all their pent-up malice, their thirst for vengeance, the creatures of night who witnessed their passage could sense this palpable threat, and fled from the sight in haste. It was as if the pestilence the town so feared had embodied itself in fifteen hundred avatars, flowing past the reeking fires with steel in their hands and murder in their hearts. Lord Zabrin woke to an unusually sharp warning. Somewhere the helpless prey was struggling with alarming strength, till it seemed quite possible that the web would not hold it any longer, and thus allow it to turn into a predator instead. He rose in silence, and not in need of lamplight to find his way, strode in darkness towards the sealed outer door of his chamber. The ornamented wood parted easily before the pressure of his hands, his bare feet moved noiselessly over the stonework of the balcony. He leaned over the waist-high crenellations, staring down at the sleeping town. From this perch in the citadel, elevated forty feet above the surrounds, he could clearly make out the imposing structure of the arena. The sun-tied night was uncomfortably warm. The acrid smell of plague prevention still rose from the streets in an incense of death. He doubted that it could serve any purpose but to mask the smell of the decaying, unburnt bodies littering the fighting pits. Yet it was a potent mask, for it could stir up hope among the living that this curse would be warded from their homes. A flicker of movement caught his eye. In the smoky light of the street lamps outside the arena, several shadows moved about with purpose. Before his troubled gaze, the shadows multiplied themselves into scores, no hundreds, converging on the squat, flat-roofed structure of the barracks. He could clearly see the ragged clothing, the makeshift weapons, 
the slaves were rising. Had the pestilence driven them to such futile madness? As he turned to summon his servant and the guard, the terrible truth dawned on him. There had never been any plague. He had been duped in a most formidable way. The alarm sounded in a burst of hunting horns before the columns could reach their destination. Though the guards on duty were quickly dealt with, there had been enough warning for the sleeping scores to barricade the doorways and reach for their weapons. Believing the slaves to be weak and desperate, the bolder sergeants mustered their men and sallied forth to engage them. They were completely unprepared for the calculated ferocity of their adversaries and fell by the dozen. All would have been lost for the defenders had some of their fellows not been cowardly enough to remain indoors during this first altercation. These last shut and barred the doors the instant they realized that their comrades were getting the worst of it, leaving those who had managed to disengage and flee stranded. The slaves lost no time in setting fire to the doors, using the conveniently smoldering piles of brush and adding a torch or two to speed things along. They were in high spirits at this easy initial victory, despite the unexpected early sounding of the alarm. Some grimaced hungrily at the sounds of distress coming from inside the barracks. It was the turn of the oppressor to beg and plead for mercy. A troop of thirty men was dispatched to the northernmost exit of the town, their task to prevent any escape in that direction, and a resulting summoning of aid. More men departed for the south to fulfill a similar function there. Two hundreds remained to watch the burning barracks, while the rest of the force drew away in a rush towards the citadel. By this time, however, the guards had had enough opportunity to prepare for the assault. The first ranks of the rebels were mown down by a withering rain of bolts from the towers and high stone walls. Seeing so many fall at once, the slaves hastily drew back into the cover of nearby structures and doorways. They had no protection from the crossbows of the keepers. It would be foolish to attempt to take the citadel by storm. Even if they succeeded, the price would be too high. An alternative scheme would have to be adopted. Soon the screams of townfolk echoed into the night. The wooden doors of their dwellings were being shattered or ripped from their hinges. Their panic was premature, however, for the rebels only dealt out death where resistance was offered. For the time being, they were merely after the doors and not the ones hiding behind them. A score of handcarts were brought up in a hurry. The men set to work fastening the looted boards to these, so as to provide a mobile shield wall under the cover of which they could approach the ramparts. Seeing their intention, the defenders feverishly commenced tying rags around a portion of their bolts. These would be dipped into oil and set alight before being launched at the wooden shields of the attackers. There was little hope of destroying the makeshift protection in this way before the wall was reached, but ordinary bolts would have virtually no effect against it. Zabrin had not been idle during the first stages of the attack. He had dispatched messengers to Xerok for reinforcements and more to the southern clearings to forewarn them of the outbreak. The citadel in Grail was not prepared for an assault of this nature. There was no equipment to withstand a siege, no pitch, little preserved food supplies or even barrels filled with water. So unthinkable had been the situation where the need for such would ever arise that no one had bothered making preparations for the eventuality. If the keepers of Grail were to hold out against the slaves and await the summoned forces, he would have to draw his men back out of reach. There was a shout from below the walls. Many voices soon took it up. An unrefined cry of rage, vengeance, and of war. On they came, the bolts flaming into the screen of wood, only occasionally finding an exposed arm or leg. Zabron swore under his breath. If only he had a score of tour warriors, he would beat this rabble back to the arena where they would beg him to take up their stations once more. 
Now he had to watch helplessly as they reached the walls to climb with astonishing speed or beat at his gate with forging hammers and staves. Even more disconcerting was the rush of battle rage that pulsed just beneath his conscious thought. The blood, the excitement, the approaching danger, all threatened to loose the fires inside his chest, till the human flesh hung but lightly on his frame. But he would not yield to it. He would keep control, not break the chain of sacrifice and ritual, turning the weakness of manhood into unimaginable potency. This uprising would have to be crushed by force of arms alone. The hammer blows on the gate seemed to shake the very walls. The keepers shifted their aim to the climbers of the wall rather than the party assaulting the gate, and soon the violent darkness was filled with the cries of wounded and dying men losing their grip on the stones to drop to the ground below. Several Vran slaves had recovered bows from the burning barracks by now, and these were discharged at the defenders with surprising accuracy. The situation was fast becoming critical. Sabrin's soldiers were reduced to two score in number. The assailants had reached the top of the wall in several places, and the sound of splintering wood now accompanied the furious blows in the arched gateway. At last, the heavy doors gave way with a wrenching crash. A war cry sounded in the courtyard below. Ulprin, in full armor, accompanied by five tour bodyguards and a dozen armed servants, stepped into the breach. Head and shoulders above his enemies, the massive warrior wielded a two-hander as though it was a short sword. The six lead slaves fell, killed or maimed, before they could retreat out of reach. Three more, pressed forward by their eager comrades, were hewn by a single swipe of the murderous blade. Barked commands molded the attackers into a semicircle of threat. Ulbrun's men moved up to protect his flanks, their spears like spokes round the hub of their master. This is the way they had entered battle before, the way they had always triumphed. The wall of slaves threw taunts and insults at the warrior, their faces contorted with rage, yet wary. Behind them the red glow gold of fire bellowed from house to house, having escaped the confinement of the barracks. Inns and brothels, homes and temples emptied their inhabitants into the screaming streets. Several score beaters, armed with spears and yelling their wild southern war cries, fell upon the slaves at the barracks. Women, some carrying infants or shepherding small children, fled into the darker, silent streets, many still pressing a scented cloth or garment to their mouths. The din and rumor of war reached after them like the plague they so feared. The Torque warriors' defense seemed impenetrable. A dozen attacks had only produced a single wound in his shield arm at the cost of the lives of five more slaves. He showed no signs of weariness, this wall of armored muscle. But bring him down they had to, or fail to take the citadel. Silently, carefully, three men crept along the stonework above the gate. They were armed with curved blades only, but it would matter little once they had executed their plan. Beneath them another assault was made, crashing like a mighty wave onto a stony beach, loud and futile. Moments passed. The slaves below were ready for another attempt. The three were in position. A breathless leap, and the warrior staggered under the weight of these unexpected assailants. A roar of triumph escaped the onrushing slaves. Hacking wildly, desperately, they threw themselves at the tangle of bodies. A furious attack from Ulbrin's spearmen threatened to free their master and drive back the slaves. But there would be no recovery. The watching slaves realized their opportunity and surged forward as a single unit. They swept the defenders through the gate and pinned them against the courtyard wall where one by one they were overcome. The Torque warrior rose only once, swordless, bleeding from many wounds, before his head was separated from his body and his mighty form trampled underfoot. Lord Zabron barred the heavy gates with his own hand. He retreated in haste as his men set about collapsing the tunnel behind them. The doors themselves would not hold back the slaves for long. 
enough rock and soil would have to block their way to discourage any attempt at reaching the surviving tour. The mallets played a dull duet in their ears as the roof support slowly gave way. He fretted at the delay. Already there were shouts on the far side of the doors. Soon they shuddered under the impact of the slaves' hammers. As if in reply, a large stone dropped from the ceiling to shatter the paving beneath. Soil sifted down in buckets full. Then a steady stream rushed in increasing volume to seal in their safety. Quickly they set to work on the next pair of supports, while the Lord of Grail, mopping his sweating brow in relief, strolled down the tunnel into darkness. It was nighttime again. The slow day had dragged past in somber contemplation, and now he was certain of it. The bright surface orb had slipped into the sea of trees once more. Though he had no way of seeing it from his earthy prison, he had grown increasingly sensitive to the subtle shift that came with the darkening of the world. Dusk contained a cool assurance of augmented power. The pressure, the discomfort of daylight gave way to the soothing shadows of a different order. New rules, new possibilities, the bold cloak of stealth dulled the senses of his enemies and opened the door to covert action. How ironical then that the slaves had chosen the same cover to do him such harm. A chance that explained Horan's hatred of these vermin. They possessed an ability to penetrate the Cloak of Darkness, which had ever been the closest ally of the tour. Zabrin had settled down for a much-needed rest when a resounding knock on the door of his improvised quarters dragged him back from the edge of sleep. He dressed hurriedly. Whoever was pounding on his door would not find him supposedly asleep. Through a curtained doorway he could hear the heavy snoring of his servant Bresh. Not even a louder repetition of the knock and an urgent calling of his lord's name made any impression on the man. Instead of waking him, Zabrin approached the door himself to fling it open in disgust. The news was ill indeed. Three bedraggled and exhausted men had found their way in from the surface before the outlying entrances had been sealed. They had formed part of a group he had dispatched to Xerox for aid, and had been unable to fight their way through the rebels sent to block the road north. The Lord of Grail listened in grim silence, then dismissed the guard. The unknown leader of the revolt had planned his actions with cunning and care. In order to gain a march on him, to win back the initiative, he would have to act in a way the other had not already anticipated. The roads to north and south had been cut. If help were to arrive, he would have to call for it himself. Ever a tricky procedure, reaching the temple in Nunmeric would be doubly difficult this night. He had no clear idea of whom to search for inside those cavernous walls, since he was not well acquainted with the priests of the capital. It would certainly be wiser and safer to call on the battle priest to perform this task. Yet he balked at the thought of it. Humiliations would be his meat for many seasons to come, as things stood presently. The ineptitude of his short reign, the unforeseen revolt, the resounding success of it. There he sat trapped like a rat, cut off from his reinforcements. What was left of his pride would not allow him to summon the aid of the priests. The single lamp burning low barely cast enough light for a shadow. It was comfortably dark, the condition in which Zabrin found it easiest to concentrate. He stilled every anxious thought, every disturbing memory. The dark tunnels faded, the streets of Grail slipped away in silence. Carefully, like a blind man, he felt his way back along the roadway to Zerok. The texture of the stony surface the fragrance of the brush that lined its edges. A disturbance barred his way. Somewhere a door closed on him, blocking his retreat. The first tentacles of fear reached for him. Was he expected? Yet again he was the dupe of the unseen mastermind. It was a slave. He could smell it, frail with age, yet shockingly potent. Something about his manner warned the tour not to expect a mere attempt at blocking communication with Lakeside. There would be a battle of wills, 
a vicious attempt to break his mind and turn his leadership into the mad blunderings of a fool. He barely managed to fend off the first onslaught. The cold rage he sensed behind the attack dwarfed his own. Zabron smiled nervously, as if to reassure himself. He was off balance already. The flicker of doubt he had felt earlier concerning Lakeside's motives had suddenly become a yawning chasm. As the fear washed and ebbed around the fortress of his resolve, part of his mind was ready to call for aid, to alert the battle priests, yet he fought against this instinct. Giving into it would destroy his chances of victory, and reduce him to a weakling in need of rescue. The image of the other's face grew clear once more. There was no triumphant sneer in the old slave's eyes as he had expected. The success of the first blow would have drawn such a reaction from him, but there was more at work here than the mere contest of wills. At once he found the reason for the calculated rage, the controlled anger in his opponent. This old man somehow knew what he was, what he had come to do here in Grail. He did not intend only to break his mind, but to destroy him utterly. Closely following came the realization, from that panicked portion of his awareness, he should have called for aid. Even as he searched for focus, the next blow sent him reeling. He tasted blood, felt the stone floor tilting wildly underneath his feet, and grabbed hold of a table to steady himself. It would not do, he knew, merely to play the target for this violence. Yet he had stooped too far to have held on to priestly defenses. But then, who could have foreseen a creature of such potency could surface so close at hand? A strong pull surged through him, till he trembled with it. He had to forsake his human form, forsake the rules of thought and being that had become little more than a prison of impotence. Zabrin was on his hands and knees, locked in battle with the unseen enemy, at war with himself. He was breathing hard, the taste of scorched flesh filled his mouth. The hastily donned clothing was too tight on his frame, he could feel the straining of the seams, but he could not yield to the animal pulsing inside him. A transformation would mar cycles of patient labor, and he had all the sacrifices already lined up here in Grail. He hesitated, willing his mind to focus. It was silent but for the dripping of his blood on the stone floor. He would wait, stealing his resolve, turning all his thought to the irresistible potency of horror and Indronog. This assailant was a fool to allow him these moments of recovery. The next blow was much less potent than before. Was the old man weakening at last? Zabron wasted no time. He crawled in what crippled pace he could summon to the doorway of his servant's room. Already he was floating into unconsciousness. The next few blows, feeble or no, could finish him off. Resh was awake and on his feet in an instant. His shocked gaze took in the desperate state of his master. He hardly had to wait for a feeble command to rush off in search of the priests. Kor fought against the clouds of nausea his every move induced. He had been such a fool. Like a young, inexperienced fighter, he had underestimated the power of his opponent, and overestimated his own. He was old, too old for such a massive expenditure of force. And yet, if he had succeeded in eliminating this destroyer, no, there would simply have been others to replace him. He drew trembling hands to his temples, forcing his mind into structured thought. Now, of all times, he had to have trouble reaching his own forces. The bid for freedom had been put off for too long, too long. Almost three hundred slaves had been lost in the assault. Two hundred more had secured the roads to north and south. With the eighty he had sent out as runners, it meant that fewer than sixteen hundred slaves remained to keep Grail until help arrived. Most of the better warriors were among the dead. More than half of the surviving slaves were too young and would be little more than useless in a fight. Still, they had succeeded in driving that murderer underground, where he would soon starve or be forced to surrender. Vran slaves were in control of the town of Grail. They had achieved what had only been dreamt of before. 
How long could they keep it? How long before the masters returned with throngs of seasoned warriors to cast against the children on the ramparts? Suddenly, urgently, he felt again the pull of open spaces he had never seen. He had to lead these youths away from war and hatred to places where the hand of oppression could not reach them. What gain was there in throwing them into futile battle? But where to go? His dreams, his visions, ended with the line rounding the hunting trails, the farm clearings in the south, the horror of the iron mines in the far east. Should he dare the road north? Would he not merely lead them to their death? What lay beyond the eastern mountains or the endless southern trees? He sighed and pressed gnarled fingers into the cavities of his eyes. Had he but the vigor of youth, hope would not desert him so easily. Overseer Groth brushed away the remnants of his hasty meal. Since assuming command of the surviving keepers, there had been little time for rest or even reflection. Though the priests had assured him that Lakeside was aware of their plight, and that the armies at Xerox would arrive within two days, he had not merely sat idle to await the rescue. All the surface exits of tunnels under the citadel had been blocked, save one a secret doorway behind the main altar in Horan's temple. Groth was convinced that no slave could know of its existence, but posted guards there nonetheless, with mallets at the ready to collapse the roof they had weakened in preparation. He would hate to be dug out from the outside rather than sally forth to meet the reinforcements, yet the unforeseen events of the past days had taught him a measure of prudence he had formerly lacked. The stricken Master of Grail had been moved out of harm's way to the lower caverns. His servant and a priest were continually at his side, guarding against further attack and giving him what aid they could. No leadership could be expected from this quarter for the present or foreseeable future. Though relieved by the temporary security they had found, Groth chafed at the forced inaction. Had he been able to overcome the faltering morale of his men, he will have ventured out on scouting missions to the surface, perhaps only to seize a captive or two to pass the time in a more entertaining way. The thought of sitting passively in the dark, while the slave scum polluted the town above, shook his large frame with frustration and disgust. Zabrin was still unable to communicate three days later, when the warriors from the north arrived. Though he was conscious, none could make out his whispered requests. Groth would have despised him for an utter weakling, had he not such vivid memories of previous encounters during which he had entertained the certainty of being little more than an unappetizing morsel on the master's plate. Yet now it had fallen to the overseer to lead the breakout through the hidden temple doors, uneasy though he was about the force that had nearly snapped a powerful Zabron like a dry stick. Many of the surviving townsfolk had moved into the spacious lower level of the temple. Though there were several slaves guarding the entrance to the structure, none ventured among the sleeping forms at night. It was a simple matter to hide his men among them and await the sounds of impending victory from without. The force from Xerox, numbering in excess of 4,000, attacked from all sides. Hungry for battle and glory, they threw themselves at the makeshift defenses the slaves had hastily constructed. The rebels, sorely missing the best of their warriors, and sensing defeat and the retribution to follow, fought with little hope. The first onslaught was repulsed with heavy losses, but the defenders had expended every last arrow and bolt they possessed. There was no talk of surrender among the slaves. They knew well that no mercy could be obtained after the severe injury they had done the oppressor. The very young and the fearful were sent back to the pits, perchance pretending not to have participated in the uprising could still save their lives. The remaining bronze slaves waited, knowing that their last hours had come, grateful at least to die as free men. On came the men from Xerox, 
Drummers beating a frenzied pulse of battle, war cries piercing the air. Their spears were bright, their spirits high. They could taste the victory anticipated for many long cycles. The slaves, youthful but resolute, dressed in a motley array of looted armor, faced them in silence. Few of them possessed fighting skills, though all were armed with steel and desperate resolve. At the first clash, the defensive line was crunched inwards, in several places. Men strained against men, hacking wildly at the raised shields, thrusting with little thought of parrying, till blood made the ramparts slippery, and the battle cries died beneath the moans of the mortally wounded. Again the attackers withdrew to regroup. The sweating drummers surged forward through their ranks, moving between them and the growing piles of bodies at the ramparts. Bowmen loosed clouds of arrows at the unwavering rebels, till the wooden defenses wore feathered flights like rhyme song fur, and men cringed behind boards and posts, not daring to peer around or over at the enemy. Boys ran here and there, gathering up as many of the shafts as they could. Several of the careless were hit, spilling their bundles for others to gather. Soon the defenders could launch them back at the attacking formations, though they were pitifully few in number compared to the unrelenting hail falling all around. Two drummers, though, were hit simultaneously, sending the rest scurrying back through the lines. The warrior ranks now set up a drumming of their own, beating on their shields with vicious clubs or mailed fists, till their blood was stirred once more to surge forward. The thinning line of slaves had no way of stopping them this time. Wounded, weakened men went down first. Lone fighters struggled on in pockets of resistance, though they were crushed or trampled. The defenses were breached. There was no begging to be spared, no cries of fear or despair. In silence they fought and fell, the slaves would be suppressed no longer. The seasoned assailants had little trouble in forcing their way through to the citadel and the temple once they dispersed the remaining rebels at the breastworks. Groth waited till he could almost smell them before he led his tiny force in a loud charge from the inner courts. They were battered enough from previous encounters to give the impression of a heroic assault from within and their blades wore the fresh blood of a guard they had overpowered. Thus the overseer managed to salvage a little honor at least, and the warriors of Grail could greet their rescuers as equals. In this way the broad-shouldered Tour could retain control in the name of his master, and exact retribution from the remaining slaves in his own fashion. These last numbered about two hundreds, mostly boys of fewer than fourteen cycles, who had returned to cower in their cells rather than be slaughtered on the walls. Among them was the still-battered form of the runner, Lund. Groth wisely decided to leave these remnants in the pits for the time being. There could be a use for them other than immediate death. The Temple of Horan was one of the few structures that had escaped relatively unscathed. The larger part of the town had been gutted by fire. Many houses and the barracks had disappeared into charred beams and ash. The crazed slaves had plundered, looted, or simply wrecked the remaining dwellings, making Grail almost uninhabitable. Rebuilding the town would take many seasons and a large amount of resources. In the light of Horan's instructions, such an undertaking would be a waste of time and effort. Zabrin rose up slowly from his knees. Around him the captains of Zerok, and what remained of his overseers and keepers did the same. The image of the destroyer towered above them, one hand stretched out in accusation, the other on the pommel of his sword. The stark empty sockets gazed upon them in hungry anticipation. Zabrin felt again the painful quickening of his pulse. The day of vengeance was about to dawn, and the end of all things Viron. Filthy creatures, Groth had called them, plotting and scheming in the dark. They had their listeners still to guide and command, and though forbidden speech, indulged in it when their masters' backs were turned. He had underestimated them, their anger, their resolve, their cunning and it had cost him the respect of his fellow Tour and his lord. 
Nine days had passed since the unknown assailant had almost destroyed him, and Zabrin could feel the terrible ache of it still. He showed no sign of discomfort, though, while he faced the contemptuous stares of the Xerox crowd. Only once he had dismissed them and was alone again with Groth did he allow a grimace of pain to contort his features. The overseer waited in silence for his instructions. He knew all too well that well-meant advice would not be welcome unless asked for. The next few days could bring back a semblance of respect for the Master of Grail, if he could shape the stricken town into order and productivity once again. His authority would have to be re-established in a very visual way before the Lords of Lakeside would arrive for the tenth day sport. Zabron had given the situation his undivided attention, even while convalescent. Apart from the younger slaves who had apparently remained in the cells out of fear, more than four score had survived the recapture of the town, while another fifty had been picked off the line while trying to force a way out. There had been more of these runners, but some would not surrender and were slain by the warriors or torn by their dogs. He gazed at the figure in front of him, lost in thought. The pits could not be emptied entirely. There was much work to be done in Grail. All the survivors will be chained and sent to the farms. Keep only those still on the first level of training. He hesitated, contemplating the futility of preparing runners who would never get the opportunity to run. But then his mouth creased into a smile. There would probably be one last royal hunt, and the need still existed for scores of easier prey. But what to do about the expected entertainment in the arena? Yes, the younger ones stay. And while you are down there, Grof, round up some women and children for the coming tenth days. Lund was more than a little surprised that he could manage a steady pace without limping. The swelling on the side of his head had subsided completely. The shoulder wound had closed. He wore a length of fabric wrapped tightly around his chest, though it impeded his breathing, for the mending ribs still caused him much pain, but there was little pity to spend on himself. Chained together by their ankles, the former runners and fighters of Grail snaked down the rutted southern road in a long ragged line. Many carried grievous wounds in their bodies. They stumbled frequently, inviting the violent attention of the lash. Three men, unable to move fast enough, had been left by the wayside already, though this was but the first day of marching. The keepers had simply slit their throats and severed the left foot with an axe to free the manacle, rather than waste time calling for a hammer. Lund had already identified at least two more in his vicinity who would share this fate ere long. Yet, despite the misery surrounding him, a strange hope filled his heart. He could find little explanation for it, if it was not simply caused by the fact that he was leaving behind the hated hunting trails where death was certain to find him sooner or later. The whistling of the whip broke through his reverie to fall on the back of a boy of about fifteen cycles behind him. There was no outcry of pain, only a throaty animal groan. The boy was almost beyond feeling and would not last the day. Three arrows had sapped his blood and strength on the walls of Grail. Lund did not even glance behind him. The helpless horror of watching another die had found him yet again. In a moment all the darkness of the recent days threatened to overtake his reason, till he wanted to fling himself screaming at the bestial guards. Everything had shrunk to futility. The bright hope of escape, the uprising, and yet he breathed still. He was alive against all probability heading away from the death pits of Grail. He had left the farm clearings as a small boy, as had these weary youths with him. Somewhere in his mind, an odd curiosity pressed on him to see the place again. In a way, he was more fearful of the depraved overseers from the clearings than of the death run in the trails. They had taught him the meaning of terror, had befouled his earliest memories with debilitating fear. What would they be to him now? He was returning to them, though they could not have imagined it, had they not sent him to his death. Here he was, marching back from Grail, a survivor, a slayer of their kind, and in the company of a hundred more. 
these men had stood up to the oppressor and were still alive, even if it was only by his leave. Silently he reached out and touched the limping form behind him. At the same time, he searched for the fearful young mind. 